it is the 50th anniversary of the water, uh, the break-in of the Watergate headquarters, and uh, there's probably a lot you haven't read about in the Washington, I mean, there is a lot you haven't read about in the Washington Post, including several notorious murders, drug trafficking payoffs to Nixon while he was in the White House. A lot of this has a lot of parallels to a guy named Donald Trump. I'm joined now by my old buddy Lamar Waldron, who is the author of Watergate, The Hidden History, Nixon, the Mafia, and the CIA. Lamar and I co-authored uh, two other books, Ultimate Sacrifice and Legacy of Secrecy. Uh, Lamar, welcome to the program. Is it true Nixon was the first person who predicted that Donald Trump was going to be president? That's exactly right, and that is per Roger Stone, who knew both men, of course, and still knows uh, Trump. And yeah, that, that's true. That was in the 1980s. Um, they were gotten together. Uh, the Stone was a Nixon aide, uh, not really involved in Watergate. But uh, Stone uh, had some dealings with Roy Cohn, who was the uh, mouthpiece for Joe McCarthy back in the blacklist days. And so, you know, one thing led to another. Roy Cohn was the mentor for Donald Trump, teaching him all the crooked techniques that really Nixon had developed and perfected. And so... Um, uh, Stone and Nixon and Trump all got together. And it was actually Stone that said it was Nixon who predicted that uh, Trump would run and, and be president someday. Wow. And, 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 and as people will hear today, Trump has used so many, so many techniques perfected by Nixon. And, and for both men, I'll say this before we launch into a, a more chronological approach. You know, if, if you look at both men as being uh, really, the head uh, of a of a crime family, everything makes very much sense about both of those. Both men, men being Richard Nixon and and uh, Donald Trump. So exactly. let's start at the beginning, 1946, or or even before then. Nixon's ties to the mafia began when he was a teenager. He was a teenager. Nixon, you know, Nixon. People remember him like there was the Oliver Stone movie and and stuff where he's kind of this socially awkward guy. That wasn't Nixon at all. Not until not until the last year or so he was in the White House. He was like a popular guy. He was like an Archie comic book uh, type thing in high school. He was good in sports, good on the debate team, good at academics. In fact, he was so good, he was going to get a scholarship to Harvard. But his dad was such a Republican that when Nixon's brother came down with tuberculosis, and they lived in California, they had it pretty good during the Depression. Not Kennedy good, but they owned a grocery store, they had a house. So they were you know, in pretty good shape for the, during the Republican Depression, as it used to be called. And, and, and yet... Uh, because the father would not, uh, California had a good uh, public hospital system to take care of uh, tuberculosis patients, which involved really going there for months at a time. Yeah. But Nixon's dad was such a hardcore Republican. He was like, no, no, that would be some sort of charity. So instead, they moved to Arizona. Uh, Nixon's scholarship to Harvard only covered like tuition. It didn't cover like living expenses and stuff. And they spent so much money taking care of the brother with TB that could have been paid for for free in California that Nixon was not able to go to Harvard. And then it got worse than that. You know, the guy who was the guy in his high school graduating class and going to go to Harvard and become part of the Eastern uh, elites, uh, he wound up as the janitor at a country club. Nixon? And he, Nixon did. And he yeah. hated that. Imagine you're having to clean toilets for these people that you were going to be superior to. This is like in Scottsdale, Arizona. Right. Um, uh, but, but now you're cleaning their toilets. But this carnival would come. It would be like a big rodeo days kind of thing in Scottsboro, the old west and everything. And, and for a couple weeks or more, there would be like these rodeos and there would be like this carnival and there would be all these sideshows and carny games and everything. And Nixon uh, apparently you know, big. He had no experience in that to be allowed to run one of the crooked carnival games. Now, these carnival games were basically owned out of Las Vegas. Okay, so like a Las Vegas mobster would come, get everything set up, and then he'd, you know, check back occasionally. And, you know, and, and, and the guy running the game, he'd basically get, get a small percentage of what he could do. But, but Nixon was a good learner. Nixon learned how to fleece the rubes, not only how to fleece the rubes, but how to fleece the rubes, have them enjoy it so much, they would not only come back the next night to get fleeced again, but they would bring their friends to get fleeced. I mean, literally, just like Donald Trump. So we just have a minute to the break. How did that connect Nixon to the mafia? 
Well, the mafia was running those games. That's where he learned that. And then Nixon, apparently, in their downtime, they learned poker. And so when Nixon was in the uh, – he learned – you know, techniques, shall we say, with poker. Nixon was in, uh, was an officer in the Navy in uh, World War II, and he fleeced all of his fellow officers and enlisted men in poker. But again, they all thought he was a great guy. So, so that's the trick, learning how to fleece people and get away with it and they even like it. And so then we get to 46, and of course the mafia, they wind up uh, helping Nixon get elected to Congress the first time, a Nixon, a uh, mafia attorney for Mickey Cohen, who was the big mobster in L.A. at the time, uh, was Nixon's campaign manager. Whoa. So, so, so that gets us to 46, and and then we're going to get into the 50s and 60s, and oh, it's just more mob all the time and more murders too. Whoa. And welcome back, Lamar Waldron, author of Watergate, The Hidden History, Nixon, the Mafia, and the CIA is with us. And uh, Lamar, we, we established before the break here at the bottom of the hour that uh, Nixon, Nixon's ties with the Mafia began when he was a teenager. In 1946, the Mafia helped him get elected to Congress, uh, which takes us up to, I think, 1954, right? Well, he gets uh, reelected to Congress, again, with the help of the Mafia. Then he gets elected to the Senate, and then he's selected as Eisenhower's running mate, uh, even though Eisenhower didn't really like Nixon. And, and so the first murders, I think we can pin on Nixon, because uh, there were some dirty campaigns, but there weren't murders involved, was in 1954. And the Guatemala coup to uh, So he's vice president now, right? Because it was 50, 52 when, he, when Ike ran for president. So, so 54, Nixon's been vice president for two years now. Exactly, okay. exactly. And he's lied about, you know, his slush funds and all that stuff. So he's, you know, so, and, and I didn't like getting his hands dirty with this stuff. So just like what happened with Cuba in a few years, you know, Ike lets, and Nick, Nixon loved to, you know, do things that involve killing people. And so Nixon, you know, had a pretty big hand. You know, I, 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 Nixon didn't get to do a lot as vice president. Uh, but that was one thing. Eisenhower was fine letting him do a lot of that. And so the CIA, basically, if you look in, in CIA, approved history books, you'll see that it was mainly a pretty much bloodless coup, and they use publicity and public relations, including a CIA uh, writer by the name of E. Howard Hunt. This is in Guatemala. This is in Guatemala in 54, and E. Howard Hunt was involved. But, but, but that's, 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 you know, that's the CIA version that was sold to American newspapers and magazines, and they ate it up because professional authors like E. Howard Hunt were literally writing this stuff up for them. What, what actually happened is there was an assassination list, you know, because you can't just overthrow a, a democratically elected government with, with publicity and public relations. You can tell people you did. But so there was an assassination list, and, and it still exists as a document. I believe it has between 80 and 100 names on it. And, and the last time I checked, which was only a few years ago, uh, the CIA was still keeping almost all the names on that list secret because, of course, if we had those names, we would know, oh, this guy was assassinated, that guy. So Nixon loved that, and they installed a brutal dictator in place of the democratically elected government. And so uh, uh, flash ahead now to 1960. The only thing Nixon's really been allowed to do since Guatemala is deal with Cuba, deal with Castro, because Eisenhower, who had had a heart attack, and so he didn't want to deal with that. So, so Nixon had, 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 had messed up his meeting in Washington with, with Fidel Castro, who was literally begging for U.S. help, because Batista, the dictator who had been very close to Richard Nixon, had stolen basically most of the Cuban treasury. But instead of saying, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give you guys some aid so your people won't starve, Nixon, like, lectured him. So that didn't work out. So Nixon basically turned to the only labor leader that supported him in America, Jimmy Hoffa, and said, look, Jimmy, uh, can you talk to your mafia friends and 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 I'll get the CIA involved and I'll say arm's length and you guys just kill Fidel Castro and we'll put the dictator back in power. Now, in part, wasn't this because this was 1960? Jack Nixon was running for president against Jack Kennedy and Kennedy was beating him up badly in the press because in '59 Nixon had basically let Cuba go communist. He had blown off Castro as you 
as you point as you just pointed out. Well, well, so so the the plots with Hoffa started in '59. By the summer of '60, they had not produced results. So Nixon said, "Screw it." He started meeting with E. Howard Hunt regularly at CIA headquarters, and they and Nixon said, "Look, I want the CIA to deal directly." Well, well, you know, I'll, I'll we'll do something nice for Hoffa, but you guys deal directly with the mafia and and Santo Traficante, the Godfather of Southern Miami, and and with with Casino, he's the guy you need to get to. And so basically, Nixon ordered the CIA to work with the mafia so that Castro would be dead before the election. JFK was, was really young compared to Nixon and relatively inexperienced. Nixon was certain that if U.S. Marines were in Cuba protecting the many Americans who lived in vacation there, that America would not go with the unproven senator. They would stick with the eight-year vice president. But, um, but there was another part of the deal, too. Hoffa was close to getting prosecuted because the Kennedys came to, came to prominence by going after Hoffa and his mafia allies. So Nixon was tight with the mafia. So, so basically Nixon says, look, we'll, we'll stall the prosecution on Hoffa until I get elected president. If, uh, if you guys, uh, Seno Traficante and, and Carlos Marcello from New Orleans and Sam Giancana from Chicago, you guys give me a million dollars, I'll stall, because basically the, the mafia was using Hoffa's uh, Teamster Pension Fund like their piggy bank. This was the Sun Valley it, land deal, right, where Jimmy well, Hoffa was using uh, uh, union funds to enrich himself? That was one of the things. That was the thing he was close to being prosecuted on, but there was so much more. Right. And so, uh, but yeah, Sun Valley was, and so basically it was a package deal. It's like, look, mobster godfathers, you give me a million bucks, I'll stall the prosecution on Hoffa till I get elected, then it'll just go away. And by the way, you work with the CIA and kill Fidel right before the election. Right. Great plan, except it didn't work because the mafia knew if they killed Castro gangland style, the way Nixon and the CIA wanted them to, the Cuban people would never let them reopen their casinos. And by the way, myth that Castro shut down on the casinos, they never reopened again. Yeah, they shut down for a few weeks, but they reopened. Guess who Castro put in charge of being the intermediary between the casinos and him after he reopened them in 1959? Frank Sturgis, who had also become a Watergate burglar. Whoa. So Frank Sturgis eventually fled Cuba, and so basically in the fall of 1960, the CIA assigns E. Howard Hunt as kind of a he's, – he's not like the official guy in charge, but he's the behind-the-scenes guy in charge. Mm -hmm. and, and they give him uh, – Frank Sturgis, who had been working for the CIA even while he was in the mountains fighting with Fidel Castro, and a guy named Bernard Barker, who had done some CIA work but had been working – for Traficante and the Mafia since 1949. Another so Watergate burglar. Mob, mobsters working with E. Howard Hunt on Nixon's plan. But as everyone knows, Nixon lost the election, which he secretly had the RNC try to contest, just like Trump. And, you know, Nixon was saying, I, you know, and, and they really did try to overturn like Hawaii and some other states. Nixon still thought for a while after the election he could still become president. But, wow. but he got his revenge on, on JFK in two ways. He, shut the, he had Eisenhower shut the Cuban embassy right before JFK was sworn in. And that's, that's where, you know, the CIA based all their spies, right? right. You know, it was in the embassy. And, and Nixon... Nor Eisenhower, nor the CIA director, or any of the high officials told JFK about the CIA mafia plots, which continued without the president or his attorney general brother even knowing about them. That resulted in the whole Bay of Pigs fiasco because, again, the mafia did not kill Fidel right before the Bay of Pigs invasion. That may have been the fault of E. Howard Hunt, as the book explains. And so, you know, so, so there's one murder that didn't happen. Was, was Mattel, but that was not for lack of trying from Nixon. So then Nixon, Nixon, um, he, 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 you know, he makes up with, with, with Hoffa and buys a house from him essentially in Southern California. Nixon runs for governor of uh, California, but because once backstage he got too comfortable with reporters and, and revealed that he regarded his supporters, his, his working in blue collar and middle class supporters as yokels, literally yokels. And he trusted the reporters so much he thought they wouldn't write about it, and one of them did. So he lost. Hmm. So then, then flash ahead to 63. Nixon is all through the newspapers in 63. You would swear he's going to run for president in 64. And, and 
as you had said before, Kennedy had been beating up on um, Nixon in 1960 over letting Cuba go communist, essentially, right? Roles are reversed in 1963. A little thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis had happened in 62. And, and, and Castro had not allowed U.N. weapons inspections for weapons of mass destruction. And so there was no pledge in place not to invade Cuba. That, that pledge was something later made by President Nixon. And so basically the Republicans were now beating up on JFK for not doing anything about Cuba. And that was only going to get worse in 64. But JFK had a plan that you and I talked extensively about back in November. Anyone who wants to know more about it can, can listen to an hour and a half's worth of that. And basically – JFK was going to use the head of the Cuban army, the number three man in Cuba, was going to overthrow Fidel Castro, basically kill Fidel Castro, on December the 1st, 1963, uh, about 10 days after JFK got back from his trip to Dallas. Right. Nixon, we know from CIA files, learned about this secret coup plan. The mafia was barred from it, but several mobsters, including Bernard Barker, and Frank Sturgis actually worked on the secret coup plan. Again, we'll talk about Bernard it, right? Barker and Frank Sturgis were Watergate burglars, too, exactly. along with Lee Howard Hunt. Oh, Lamar, continuing the story. Well, so three other names that you'll want to remember, and your listeners, were also involved with the coup plan. That was James McCord, also one of the Watergate burglars and head of security for the Nixon re-election committee in 1972. But, but at this time, he was a, a, big, uh, a big wig in security for the CIA. Alexander Haig, who was a colonel at that time, and a guy by the name of Alexander Butterfield, who was in the later stages of the coup plan. And who was the guy who revealed the taping system exactly. in the White House. Exactly. And, and Alexander else. Haig would later become Nixon's chief of staff. Right. So, 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 but we won't go into any more about the coup plan. Mafia infiltrated it, used parts of it to kill JFK in a way that, that forced the government, including Robert Kennedy, to cover up so much, which continues today. Right. So, so let's go ahead now to 1968. Robert Kennedy is assassinated, not by Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon had nothing to do with Robert Kennedy's assassination. However, Nixon's mafia allies, like Jimmy Hoffa and Carlos Marcello and Johnny Roselli, were involved. Okay, and that's, that's in the book as well. Now, as you have, have talked about on your program many times, Nixon then committed treason to win the 1968 election, causing 20,000 additional U.S. deaths of our troops and medical personnel, and, and probably many times that of Vietnamese deaths. Right, an estimated one million additional Vietnamese deaths. You know, so he's got blood on his hands from that. So now let's flash ahead. But Nixon wins, right? You know, he, he, whatever it took to win, he, he would do it. So now we're in the winter spring of 71. Johnny Roselli reveals to America's top journalist at that time, Jack Anderson, who has a column that's in all the leading papers about the CIA mafia plots, leaving out pretty much only Richard Nixon's role in them. So that's a sort of Damocles. Roselli's getting ready to be sent off to prison. He's not even a citizen, so he's liable to be deported. So that's why he's leaking to Jack Anderson. People have heard that the Plumbers, the, the White House you know, criminal group, was formed over the Pentagon Papers that Daniel Ellsberg leaked. Totally not true, because even before Nixon knew about the leak, in April of 1971, uh, E. Howard Hunt was down in Miami at a Bay of Pigs reunion recruiting Frank Sturgis, Bernard Barker, and other Cuban exiles who all had been involved in the CIA mafia plots. So the plumbers were formed to keep a lid on the CIA mafia plots, you know, not over the Pentagon Papers. Now, that summer, the plumbers' first big break-in and, and by the way, Nixon wanted to blow up. People have heard of the Brookings Institute, this think tank in Washington. Mm -hmm. Nixon was ready to have the plumbers just blow that up. If people died, he didn't care. Wow. Uh, but, but he was talked out of that. But Daniel Ellsberg had a close female friend when he was in Vietnam who was the daughter of one of the CIA supervisors for the CIA mafia plots in 63. Nixon and Hunt worried that she might have heard about the plots from her father and shared them with her very close friend, Daniel Ellsberg. 
Um, and by the way, Frances Fitzgerald later became a very, very acclaimed writer. So she, you know, she was a you know, brilliant woman. So yeah, it would make sense. Her dad would might have well have shared that. He, he was dead by then. So that's why they broke into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Now you need to ask yourself, what would have happened if they had been discovered by someone? Yeah. And you had two mafia killers, Bernard Barker and Frank Sturgis, you know, on that burglary team. And I, you know, I think somebody could have been killed if they had been discovered burglarizing the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Wow. Lamar Waldron is with us. Lamar, we were just uh, recapping. We're up to uh, the uh, uh, 1970s, uh, I believe. And uh, we've got uh, Frank Sturgis and Bernard Barker, two mafia killers who were also Watergate burglars. They have just broken into Daniel Ellsberg's office. Um, where do we go from here? Well, and then just a few months after that, Nixon forms his own little White House anti-drug group. And guess who he puts on it? Two men still working for Santo Traficante, America's largest heroin trafficker, Barker and Sturgis, are on the White House anti-drug group. In the meantime, there's a huge opioid epidemic in America, especially among servicemen returning from Vietnam and Southeast Asia, because there is what, what you can read in plenty of newspaper accounts, congressional investigations, something called the service club scandal, where they were literally getting heroin in the service clubs where they would go for rest and recreation. But and it's it was worse mafia than, heroin, right? Well, it was mafia heroin. And by the way, you know, Nixon has, you know, Nixon, basically Nixon's his top eight at that time, uh, John Ehrlichman, later admitted Nixon's whole war on drug was just a, it was just a political thing to, right. you know, because because blacks and young people weren't going to vote for for Nixon anyway. So so that's all a sham, obviously. But Nixon was getting monthly payoffs from Santo Traficante's Southeast Heroin Associates, which was later confirmed by Al Haig himself. So Nixon's wow. literally getting these monthly payoffs. Every, every U.S. serviceman who got hooked over there and then died of an overdose here or had their lives shortened or committed suicide because of their addiction, that blood is on the hands of Richard Nixon. And, and you know, but Nixon, again, whatever it takes, December 71, he gets a new million-dollar bribe from the mafia, Traficante and Marcello, to release Jimmy Hoffa from prison, but with the proviso, Hoffa can't become president of the Teamsters again for 10 years because the soft guy, Frank Fitzsimmons, who replaced Hoffa, is much easier for the mafia to deal with. So, so everything just ramps up. You know, he's, he's got all this money from the mafia. They, they get these dirty tricks teams, which are really political felony teams. They get rid of the, the, the first three uh, people that Nixon does not want to run against, Edwin Muskie, um, um, uh, Scoop Jackson, Senator Scoop Jackson, and a moderate North Carolina governor, Terry Sanford, because Nixon wants to run from a governor, and he's worried Humphrey or Ted Kennedy might jump into the last minute. And, and then they get some horrible news, and that is that Fidel Castro has prepared a dossier of all the CIA attempts that he knows about of, of, the, of the CIA attempts to try to kill Fidel all the assassination attempts, and the Chilean embassy in Washington has a copy of that. Okay, so, so literally a document that could end Nixon's career, and if the bribe is mentioned in there, send him to prison, is in the embassy of, this, of the uh, socialist uh, Chilean embassy in Washington. So guess what Nixon has the plumbers do? And, and this is, a, Frank Sturgis admitted this. You won't find this in, in any Watergate book except for mine, just about. They burglarize the Argentine, I'm sorry, the Chilean embassy. They don't get the dossier, but apparently they find a page or two or references to it. So they're really worried. Now, right after that, there is a plan to kill Daniel Ellsberg that Ellsberg has talked about, where these two mafia guys, Sturgis and Barker, were going to stage some sort of provocation at a big demonstration. And Ellsberg swears to this day he thinks he was going to be murdered by them. And, and, and Ellsberg thought that without even knowing the mafia background of Sturgis mm -hmm. and Barker. I think Ellsberg is exactly right. So, so now the worry is, have the Chileans given this secret dossier of assassination attempts and maybe the bribes to the Democratic National Committee. That's why there are four attempts to burglarize the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate. Two are successful, at least as far as getting into the office. Of course, the fourth one goes awry. They had enough uh, film to take a thousand photographs. 
everyone on the team in the Watergate had been part of the CIA mafia plots in one form or another, including the human exiles. So they were trying to cover up their own attempts to assassinate Castro for, exactly. for Nixon's political benefit. Exactly. And, 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 then, and then to flip associated. that on its head, the night after the assassination, uh, one of the arresting officers... Of Jack Kennedy. Uh, I, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Of the break-in. Oh, the night, the night, night after, after the, the break-in, break okay. one of the uh, officers who had arrested them in the, in the DNC offices, a guy named Schaffler, uh, goes to talk to Frank Sturgis. And Frank Sturgis is about to, is literally about to have a heart attack. He says, look, I, I've been working for the mafia. I'm still working for the mafia. They're going to kill me. Uh, you know, Santo Traficati, he's best friends with the godfather, Joe Nestline of Washington. I, I'm going to die. I, you got to do something. Yeah, I, I'm going to be killed. We got to wrap it up, Lamar. Well, and so basically, uh, let's flash ahead to the people who were killed. Uh, um, Jimmy Hoffa dropped dime on Johnny Roselli, who was talked to by the Senate Watergate Committee. Johnny Roselli would later be killed after testifying before a Senate committee in 1976. Sam and Nixon Giancana. had something to do with all of these. Is that what oh, you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 